solid strategies are basically the approach. You know, the approach that you're going to take to ensure that you do the audit and be able to achieve the main goal effectively. So this one, it sets out the direction, how the audit should go, the stages, you know, the audit procedures, and also the timing and the scope to be covered, right? So I say that uh, strategy, in other words, nika ujanja, ama ukora in a positive way. Najua kuna wale wajanja kama sungura. So, see at in a bad way. But so, just like the same, when you're doing the same thing, you need to be very skeptical and you need to be able to identify areas of high risk. So the approach that you're going to use when you're going to do this audit work is now what we call audit strategy. So you need to set up the direction where will the process go? What are the steps I'm going to take? What am I going to start with? And then which areas am I going to touch? And again, you need to know the scope. How wide are you supposed to go? Or how deep are you supposed to go? Also the time that you're going to take, the strategy should be able to uh, set up the timing. Because you need to know when am I supposed to report? When am I supposed to have a meeting? When am I supposed to deliver the report, final report? And when are we going to have the GM? It is very important when you also set up the timing because if you don't have the correct timing, you might spend more or you might realize that you've not done anything. Unaenda kazini, una realize that uh, there are things that you didn't plan well because of lack of strategy, there was no planning. So it is just like part of planning the strategy. Lazima tu umejipanga vizuri, right? So in the context of the statement above, explore the silent, salient features that distinguish a system approach of audit and risk-based audit approach. So uh, in our last class, who can tell me, we did this in topic number four. That's why topic number four was quite wide. Yeah, so who can tell me uh, what a risk-based approach is? Risk-based approach. You are approaching this audit with the mind that I'm going to apply risk-based approach. What is it? And some, someone else can also define a uh, uh, system-based approach. So I want ladies to give me a system-based approach and then gentlemen to give me risk-based approach. Dear to Malaysia Raka, risk-based approach, gentlemen, ladies, system-based approach. I taught the same in class. And I believe you are pressed unless you came late. We shall, we shall excuse you. Take it, take it, please, so that you save time. You can also talk. Uh, let me unmute a few uh, so that you can be able to have interactive session. I don't like a silent class. Nataka watu onge. Na expect sasa Calvin onge hapa, Badawi, Susan, those are my very active students. Margaret, Michael, Jen, Inet. Nataka mwonge, Rebecca, please. Instead of writing, explain in words, and then we'll help you to frame it correctly. Just explain. Writing, writing will take time. Writing will take time, and we don't have much time. You can just explain what you can. Yes. Thank you. Risk-based risk approach. The auditor will concentrate on the high-risk areas uh depending on the scope of the audit work so the area of concentration the area of concentration will be just on the high risk areas thank you thank you very much now that brings me to the next question what determines the approach of audit strategy what determines the strategy to be used again they can ask you an exam we are saying now that the auditor can decide whether to use a risk-based approach or system-based approach. So what informs him to make what decision or what approach to use? What informs the auditor to use the and in a certain kind of approach, what involves the auditor to use particular approach? I can try on that one. The auditor, what determines audit approach to be used? Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. Go ahead, try. Oh, I can say one of the factors is uh, the risk assessment. Risk assessment. Yes. <laughs> that is true. Or you can call it risk level or risk exposure. That is very true. Uh -huh. uh, somebody is saying that characteristics of the engagement, uh -huh. the nature of engagement. Okay. Yes, there are engagements that you can't, you have to use a certain approach. Volume of transactions. Uh -huh. So this is the same as scope of audit scope. Scope of audit matters, matters, right? Because we say that the strategy sets the direction and also the scope. So scope, this one is something that are uh, interchangeable. The scope affects the strategy, but the strategy also affects the scope. Uh, intended use of the report, yes. The, expected report, nature and use of the expected report. The report that requires very accurate, uh, uh, very accurate uh, opinions, right? Where the risk level should be very low. So it depends on the nature, that is the kind of report that you need to give and the use, the use. The reports that requires a very uh, accurate level of uh, opinion, like the opinion should be very, very close to the correct one, then there's strategy that you have to apply. Also, another one, uh, strength and weakness of the class internal control system. The strategy, of course, internal control system has something to do with the, with the risk assessment, but you can use it if you have a clever marker, you will know that it's the same thing. So uh, the strength and weaknesses of the ICS. Of course, if it is weak, then that means that the risk is high. So that is why I'm saying that almost the same. As uh, there's so many gain up a volume of transactions, impact of the assessed risk. The impact of the assessed risk, that is the same as the risk assessment you have to show now. Level of audit risk, that is the same. Thank you very much. Uh, Susan has tried here. She has given us a definition of system-based approach. It, it, uh, it assesses the effectiveness of internal control system. Uh -huh, that is a good trial. Risk-based approach focuses on a high risk material misstatement. Yes, that is true. A risk-based approach focuses on areas with high risk of material misstatement. So that one, we have seen all of them. Availability of resources, that also another one, yes. And timing. You have constraint, time and resource constraints. So availability of resources and timing. So this actually affects uh, the strategy that is going to be used. So when you talk about these strategies, how many strategies do we know? There's one that is called balance sheet. Balance sheet approach. We have system-based approach. Then we have uh, risk-based approach. So I want you to understand this kind of approaches very well. The first one is called balance sheet approach. This approach is normally used when the auditor assumes that if the balance sheet items, understand that, we normally have in our financial reports, we have balance sheet items, and we also have PLL items. Now with them, 
The balance sheet approach believes that if the items in the balance sheet approach were correctly posted, they are accurately posted and completely posted, well disclosed, it means that all the assertions are confirmed. Then there is no need of confirming PL items because automatically PL items should be okay. Why? If, for example, receivable is okay, cash and balances are okay, that means that the sales should be posted correctly because these are quarter entry. That is what they are saying. Kwamba, kama uli post receivable Missouri, na tena uka post cash and cash equivalent Missouri, then that is what makes up sales. So sales is okay. There is no need of now focusing on sales. So PL item should be okay by default. They are also saying that if the payables are okay and all the liabilities, then that shows that even expenses are, should be okay. Expenses should be automatically correct. So this approach focuses on balance sheet item and it believes that if the balance sheet items are correctly posted and accurately posted, completely posted, then items on the P&L will automatically be okay. So, so we shall come to the testing. We shall come to the testing. Now, that is, uh, that is the approach for audit where you are now going to apply this test, Emmanuel. Once you have decided now that the approach that you need to use is called balance sheet approach, that is a strategy. Now, from there, you need to ask yourself, am I going to now use a control test or I'm going to use substantive test? First, you need to decide. Remember what they're saying here. The audit strategy. So these are the strategies that you're going to use. So once you picked any of these, then now you ask yourself, which test now? Which test? These are the strategies. You picked one of them. Now you ask yourself, now on this, how am I going to apply substantive tests to confirm the balances on the balance sheet? Once you have done that, I tell them now, P and L. Or you want to use now the control test. Of course, you normally start with the control test, meaning that whatever approach you're going to pick here, you now ask yourself first that does controls work? You test the control. If the controls fails, then now you go back to the substantive test. Substantive test is normally applied where the controls have been confirmed to be weak. But if controls are very strong, then you can use it. Now we have system-based approach. This one believes that uh, whatever is generated in the system is what you're going to use. You focus on the system, the controls. So this one mostly depends on the internal control system because you believe that uh, everything that has been posted in the system is okay. So if they're okay, then whatever is generated, you can use it. You can use what is generated only. So you don't need to worry about much. But this one is very applicable where the controls are very strong. So that when you generate the report, this report that is dependent. So this particular approach based on the reports that is generated in the system, it believes that inter uh, the control systems are very strong. And so we can depend on them. This one, system-based approach. Then we have the last one, which is risk-based approach. They have said that you focus on areas of high risk. So even if the areas of high risk is in the system or it is off the system, you focus on that area. So that means that once you do what is called risk assessment, once you've done risk assessment, then you can now say that this one is very risky. I can't just believe or depend on balance sheet approach. I can't just depend on system-based approach. I have to do what is called risk-based approach because the client is very risky. So I need to identify those areas of high risk because the possibility of you giving a wrong conclusion is very high. So that is why we say that a determinant on which approach here or strategy to use, which strategy to use are here. The nature of engagement. If the engagement is the one that requires accurate results, then of course you need to use a system that can give you accurate results. And obviously that can be balance sheet. It can be balance sheet. Balance sheet might actually be wrong. And so today's auditors normally use risk-based approach because this one is quite objective. It doesn't ignore much. So, so and of course it reduces auditors risk. Now, uh, so you know the differences. And so you can give example. More on that, you're going to do your personal studies next time you should be having more points on that.
The second question asks, describe the factors that influence the choice of an audit strategy. But you are given the answers. These are what determine the approach. You have given me the answers, all right, of the strategy. So these are the strategies that we're talking about. And then these are the factors that determine which strategy you're going to use. You can add many if you get more. So that's number three. Number three is done. I want us to go to number one. Number two looks like a very long thing. It is a case study. And because of time, I can't be comforted with it. I'm not sure I come out from Aliza. So let me go to number one. It looks scanty. It looks very uh, short. So let's try this. Uh, then number two, come to a time at a because it looks wide. So, so. At a quick exam, at a quick exam, start with the ones that are, are actually easier to pass. Somebody's saying something. Uh, on a text in on up in a potato, two, three B, one, three B at Japan. Are you sure? Atoku vanya yu jana, inasema nini? Nini four, so is three B. Oh, three B. Oh, yu jana tulipanya hii. Okay, sawa. So three B says that uh, there is a strong interconnection between, let me share with you, your warning. It says that there's a strong interconnection between a financial audit and operational audit. However, difference also exists. Discuss the statement above. Clearly bring out any difference between the two types, surely. I taught this in section four, audit, and also here. This is still topic four, I believe. In topic four, they really set a lot of questions from this topic. Go and review that topic. Watch videos where you can. Don't underestimate topic four. I think these are the people who did a very uh, difficult paper because it was concentrating on one topic. So come away only kwa where like the So they're saying, let me wrap this one. This for those who are doing tax. So do we have really problem on this financial audit? Then we have operational audit. How many marks? Four marks only. So that means that uh, Uh, you only need to give some two differences, then you are okay. So who can tell me the first, in terms of definition, what is financial audit? What is financial audit? You can as well speak. <clears throat> I can try. Yes, please. Okay. Um, financial audit is the independent examination of financial statements to determine if they reflect a true and fair view of the company's operations. Well, Sorry, come uh, again to determine? Just repeat somewhere there to determine? Or to determine if they reflect a true and fair view of the company's operations. While operational audit is the audit of um, the activities of the company. Okay, the audit of routine activities of the company, if they, if they are economical, efficient and effective in terms of the use of the resources. Thank you very much. I think you have just 
killed it. And that is basically what I was waiting for. So as Peter is saying that examination of historical financial information, I think what he has given is quite uh, uh, elaborate and he has given even example. For operational audit, you're going to look at even the effectiveness and efficiency, meaning that when you're doing operation, you need to ensure that you use less resources but achieve more, no wastages. So this one focuses on general operations. Whether you are following the, uh, you're using, allocating the resources correctly, you are having the right person doing the right thing, the resources are not being misused, that is what it basically focuses on. But, on financial audit, you are focusing on the financials and whether they represent the true person of the company. It's the one that most people do. When it's get to statutory, uh, any statutory audit or normal audit, people think about financial audit. It is the one that most people focus on. It shows the uh, reflection of the company's financials on the ground. It should give us that kind of a reference that this is what is actually happening on the ground. So it basically focuses on the financial because of the company. So that is what it means, right? It, it actually focuses on the controls when it comes to errors and fraud that could be in the financial statements. It focuses on those things, errors or fraud. So financial audit, you can say, you can say that financial audit focuses on analysis and verification, focuses on analysis and verification. It focuses on analysis and verification of the financial affairs. Or you can use the word examination, uh, the way Emmanuel has said. Examination of the financial affairs of an organization through analysis of financial records. I'll repeat again. Financial audit focuses on analysis and verification. Analysis and verification of the financial affairs of an organization through analysis of financial records over a given period of time. And so Peter was okay over a period of time. That is historical. You look at the historical records, then check whether they actually represent true and fair over a period of time. It focuses on analysis and verification, or basically examination of financial affairs of the organization through the analysis of financial records over a given period of time. Over a given period of time. So that is basically what it means. The other one, it was, uh, the other one is a uh, operational audit. Still. So this one focuses on, operational audit checks the operations of organization it checks on the operations of the organization. No, you can say that it checks whether operations of the organization, it checks whether operations of the organization, it checks whether operations of the organizations are being carried out effectively and efficiently. Whether operations of the organizations are being carried out effectively and efficiently. It reveals, you can say, it reveals systems. It reveals systems. It reveals system, internal controls and procedures of an organization. It reviews system, internal controls, and procedures of an organization. It reviews system, 
internal controls and procedures of an organization in order to evaluate whether they are being constructed efficiently and effectively and to make suggestions on improvements and to make suggestions on improvement. So we are trying, saying to say that uh, they are trying to assess the level of controls that we have that is exercised by management, but it focuses on effectiveness and efficiency of the operations, just as um, Emmanuel has said. Because if the operations are not effective, that means that there is a, pro a problem. If the controls are not working well, there will be wastages. And so if there is wastages, that, that means that you are not efficient, right? So it looks at the efficiency of operations, reliability and integrity of the financials as a whole, the information, the safeguard of assets, looks at the reliability of financials and operational information, safeguard of assets, and other areas like compliance with the rules and regulations. So it is quite wider compared to financial audit. It is quite wider because we know when you're working somewhere, you are in operations. Those operations affect a lot of things. The controls, whenever there is a wastage, it affects financials, right? If the controls are not working well, it affects the financials. If there is no follow up of procedures, people do not follow procedures in operations or rules or regulations, that one also part of operations, but it affects another audit, which is called a procedural audit. So procedural audit focuses only on procedures and rules, compliance, those are the things that it focuses on. Operations is quite general. But the main aim is the effectiveness and efficiency of the operations so that you can be able to give reliable information reports. Okay, so we have another one that is called management audit. We have another one that is called management audit. It examines it examines, management audit examines the efficiency and adequacy of an organization's operating procedures. It focuses on efficiency and adequacy of an organization's operating procedures. It focuses on or it examines the efficiency and adequacy of an organization procedures. Full stop. It is a systematic examination. It is a systematic examination of decisions and actions of management to analyze the performance. That is management audit. It focuses on management and how it operates. So you are auditing management performance. And of course, management performance overlaps, right? So it is a systematic, it is a systematic examination of decisions and actions of the management to analyze the performance. A systematic examination of decisions and actions of the management to analyze the performance. It attempts to evaluate the performance of various management processes and functions. It evaluates various performance of management. It evaluates various performance of management processes and functions. So it looks at the functions of management then evaluate. And of course, some of the functions of management includes controls, organizing, all right, leading. So it evaluates various management processes and functions. So it is also a method of basically evaluating the effectiveness and efficiency of management at all levels throughout the organization. 
efficiency and effectiveness of management at all levels throughout the organization. That is management audit. It, look at, it looks at the management performance. That is what you are auditing, management performance. So let's look at question number two. Um, let me share the screen. Time PA in and bio. That's why we should join very fast. But it's fine, shall overcome. So uh, these guys were saying that there is connection between operation. So we have seen the differences. So uh, bring out any difference between the two types of audit. When you define and give example of areas of coverage, you are getting your four marks. You define it, then give examples. Now, like the other one for financials, we say that it looks at there, whether there, is an, there are any errors or misstatement in the financials, whether the financial re re reflect the true and fair view of the financial position. That's actually, you deserve two months. Then when you come to operations, we have also been able to give a lot of points there. Now, management have been able to explain. I think there is another question for management audit somewhere. Look at this question number B here. Management audits calls for an interdisciplinary approach considering the scope and focus of the audit. Discuss the above statement with particular reference to steps involving management audit, management functions appraised. We know now the areas that you need to uh, audit when you are when you are doing management audit. You are supposed to appraise or examine, you know the functions of management. And so they are telling you that tell them about the areas of functions of management to be appraised. You need to appraise the control. You need to appraise organization. You need to appraise staffing, leading functions, and those other functions. So they are saying that discuss the above statement with particular reference to management functions appraised. So which management functions are these that are appraised? Sasa hiyo ndi wanataka. Now, the next one, the audit techniques to be adopted. Audit techniques to be adopted. That is basically uh, the audit approach. Then explain the potential threats of an auditor's independence. Threat to auditor's independence, hii mnajiwa. So, which one do we start with among these three questions? Na yinye mnanipea answers here. Inquiries, yes. That is the, the one. I, I like the way uh, Emmanuel is seeing these things. Now, in this question, when they talk about audit techniques, they are not asking for the strategy. They are asking for those small, small things that you do, like inquiries, observations, you know, those are the, the inspections, those are the audit techniques that you're going to use to audit the functions of management. That's what they are asking. So you need to tell us, how would you apply inquiry to audit functions of management. So that is what basically they are looking at. And then what is the advantage of management audit? Why is it important? So to answer pole pole, to answer kwanza isi, you is in Mboga. You guys need to tell me the potential threats to auditors' independence. What are the threats to independence? You remember we talked about Remember, we talked about the courts of ethics. We talked about courts of ethics. because it is efficient. So this is what we are looking at, this one, threats to an auditor's independence. Basically, they are trying to check whether you really understand the threats to courts of ethics. So courts of ethics are number one, Independency. Number two, integrity. Number three, we have uh, confidentiality. 
we have number four, uh, objectivity. Number five, we have competency or professional competency. We have professional behavior. And you care. Now, what are the threats to ethical standards? These are ethical standards or codes of ethics. Ethical standards or codes of ethics. So, what are the threats? Self-interest, familiar threat. Now there's no money a formula. Let's use that formula. Surface. It acquire easy. So to me, your formula it acquire easy. So we start with self-interest. We have advocacy, threat, threat, threat. We have familiarity. We have intimidation. We have self review. Now, these are the threats to ethical standards. So the next question is, how do you now check or how do you relate these threats with their independence? Integrity, confidentiality. So if they were asking about the threats to independence, then you can't be independent when you have self-interest threats. Any interest will be open So that means that you can't be independent. You are already influenced, all right? So independence. And this one you remember the independence laps of independence in mind and also independence in appearance. You remember that. The next one here is advocacy. It also affects independence over relying on a single client. That one can cause. Now, the next, that is the next question, Nani Peter. If they ask you what causes advocacy threat, how can this come out? How can self-interest come out? Then you can now say over reliance on a single client over period, it's bringing what is called familiarity threat. So, so when you are Auditing one plan for long, it affects you because you're going to be familiar with that. But again, it also affects you because you are not going to be independent, being that this is your source, your main source of income. Imagine one plan paying you 200,000 and you only have three plans, the rest are paying you 50, another one is paying you 40. You are over relying on that client, it will affect you. You are not going to be independent. But again, you are also going to be familiar with this plan if you over rely on this plan for a longer period, having one plan for a longer period without project rotation. So the solution for this is that you need to have so many plans so that you don't over rely on one plan. But again, we say that familiarity also comes in when you rely on one plan for a longer period, not in terms of money, but in terms of the time frame. It affects you. So this one rotation is the solution. So you need to ask yourself, among these, what are the causes of this? And how are they applicable here? So, so, so Peter, that answer is very okay. Personal or family relationship, that also helps. It creates, again, this threats. When you have a relationship, then you, you normally automatically you have some self-interest, right? Right now, if you're a judge and your best friend have a letter of routine, now when you're a judge, and that is your relative. That is your long-term friend. I'm a little bit like 
Of course, you have some interest. Unataka, unataka a succeed in the case here. Yeah. So that means that you have interest. You cannot be dependent. Yeah, you cannot be independent. So you need to remember, remind yourself here. And then now safeguard to this place. Now you have to submit. What does it safeguard to this place? Safeguard to threats. Can I get a few answers here? Then we move from there. So what I'm basically saying, when you come to independence or any of these, just look at which one amongst them can affect here. Even intimidation affects here. Mutu ameku intimidate that you know if you don't give us the report that you want, how to pata ikazi. Sahau. Ama nakwambia, utajipata huku Karura Forest. Usipo to pay a report bila tunataka. So there's threat. So are you going to still be independent? No. And of course, it also affects objectivity. Once you're not independent, then you're not going to be objective. Again, it affects competency. You can't do the right thing because of intimidation. So this thing was direct. These guys wanted you to come and pick among the threats which one affects independence. You can resign. <laughs> so the first one here, we say that uh, we have advocacy review and explain. Okay. So uh, advocacy is when you find yourself supporting the client position. Yeah. Advocating or advocates, those people support their client. So advocacy is the same. Instead of you being somebody who follows the standard, who is not biased, unajipata. So it affects this. Advocacy also affects this. Meaning uh, it affects objectivity. You are going to be biased. Because you are supporting the class position. Assuming that KRA has come, KRA are following your client. You are the auditor. Na KRA wana kuja kwa client wako. Alafo wana jipato na tetea. Na mambia, no, wana mbia KRA na, you know, this is not what he did. It is supposed to be this. When you know very wrong, very well that the client is wrong. You know very well that the client is wrong. You are advocating for the client. That is advocacy threat. You are actually promoting the client position. You are promoting the client position, meaning that you are no longer fair. You are not standing for the truth. The truth. So you are not honest. Honesty is also affected. Advocacy threats affect honesty. Advocacy also affect this. Advocacy also affect this. It also affects this. Affect this. Affect this. Supporting the client position. Don't. Then when we come to self-review, this is a situation where you are the same, you are the auditor or a professional who is actually performing an assurance service for the client and also assurance service. So review is basically like audit, I said that, right? So how do you audit yourself? Umefanya bookkeeping ukamaleza, unakuja ku audit your book, unakuja ku audit nini? When you umefanya hizo makosa, so how can you audit yourself? You can't do bookkeeping or tax for the client, and then you want to audit the same, same period, the same, same books. That is called self-review. Of course, it will affect your uh, objectivity, right? Self-review will affect your objectivity, and also professional competency will be affected. Independency will be affected. So, on a, independence is gonna almost kill a kitu, almost kill a kitu, and you only need to explain. This is what they were setting. So don't go around the bush. They were asking you, do you understand service? That is what they were setting in that paper. So you only pick whatever is here, then link it with this, how it affects independence. Pick another one, link it to that. So uh, because of time, I wish that we can stop from there. I'm sending you a few notes. I'm sending you a few notes. Uh, on management audit importance i want to send you a few notes on management audit so that uh, you go through it at your own time so so sahi to
So that is the end of class for today. Tutamalizia your question number three tomorrow. The rest part of management audit I'm sending you now. Where pia wendo jitaputia zingine. I'm sending you a few now. So, so, so that is the end of class. Safeguards for Nazo for notes. Go and read now that one. You have the Please keep on reading the notes. Me kazi yango ni kuamusha akili. Just to wake up your mind, but not to give you everything. Already I've given. Nilifanya class ni kapeana notes. Right now I just remind you on areas which you need to look at. So if I touch on this, Natina, I touch on this, you can now go and check on this, you have the notes, and also after the class. Surface, so yes. Advocacy is ni mesema. Advocacy ni ku support or promote client position. Eh? Yani umekazana o kijaribu ku promote client position. Hata kama ako wrong. Advocating for client. Ni mesema. So, go and look for this. It is topic number three. For those who are looking for it, equal topic number three. Sawa, so, sawa. So. You are not topic number three. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much.